Okay. Now we're in our next class. <laughs> Change your hat. Um, I'm going to briefly go over Chapter 10, or review any of the homework questions that you have, and then I'm going to move on to Chapter 11. So those of you that are here, you understood the Part 1, Chapter 10 homework, right? Is there any questions on that? So I don't need to go over that. So then the Part 2 homework, um, you all, let's see. For for 10.4a, I I got uh, around 437 or 438. Did y'all all get that? Yes. Okay, so there's no question there. 10.5a, I got um, 51.5625. Yeah, I rounded it to 563. Yeah, that's fine. So everybody, y'all all in agreement with that? Yes, okay. 10.5B, I got 196.6. Everybody agree? Okay. So those that aren't here, don't know how we got that. Okay. 10.6A <laughs> is 1.93. Right? Yes. And then 10.6C is the one you had a problem on. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so let's work through that one. Um, it says compute the radius of gyration with respect to the XX axis for the built up section shown in figure 10.9B. That's on page 10.9B is on page 197. Okay. Do you want me to work it out on there, or just talk through it, or what? Um, what do y'all think? It's so hard to draw in there. <laughs> Let, well, let's talk through it a second, and then you can tell me where you got, got a trouble. So you've got your, um, where's that little pencil? You've got your shape. which is just an I-beam. And then the tricky part is, of course, that you've got a channel sitting on top of it. And the channel, if you look it up in the table, its axis runs that way, right? And the I-beam runs this way. And they want you to compute the radius of gyration about an axis somewhere around there. So what you have to do is... Uh, Look at the table um, for the W10 by 30. And 14 by 30. 14 by 30, sorry. And then, um, so the, from the table, I think that's where I got this information. The IX is 0.291. Is that right? And then the, I guess I'll just write it out. So for the W, oh. Okay, so from the table, we're doing a W of 14 by 30. And from that, we get an I X equals 0.291. And then we got 2.291. Is that right? No, the I is... I see 2.91. 0.291. Oh, I did that wrong in my thing, too. I have the dot there still. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and the area is 8.8, you're right. And then the little b, which is the depth, is 13.84. So, and you need that information, because, so, so then your formula, 
is your IX is going to equal the IO, which is uh, plus AZ2. AZ squared. So that transfers equals the 291, which is the IX plus 8.85, which is the area, or 8.8, plus z, uh, area times z squared. And the z squared is, uh, how did I get that? Um, well, it's the, it's the top part, though, I believe. So you you got to take 13.84, which was behind here right there, which is the depth, minus 9.12. Wait, no, how did I get that? Okay, it's 13. Shouldn't it be 13.84? It's the difference between the, the actual center of this. It's this dimension right here is what we're looking for. So this is where we're figuring out the new XX. This is the XX of the I-beam, or the W. So you got to take 13.h4, which is the dimension from there to there, then it gave you 9.12, which is, maybe I drew that wrong. Oh, okay. So 13.84 divided by 2 is 6.92, which would be from here to here. That's half of 13.84. And then uh, the 9.12 is the new axis. So you take 9.12 minus 6.92, and that gives you the 2.2, which is the IO, or the Z, I mean. Does that make sense? So this is 9.12. Minus 6.92 equals 2.2. So that's that's where you get the z. That's the z. So back here to this formula, it's 2.91 or 291 plus 8.8 .8 times 2.2 squared. Y'all follow that? Yes? No? Maybe so? Do you, Josh? Sort of. Because <laughs> the, the Z is the difference. If you look in the book, Z is the distance between the two parallel axes. So that's where we get that from. Because they gave us the, the 9.12 is the axis for this whole unit that they want you to figure it out for. But the axis for the W is lower than that. So you've got to find the difference in those. And then you can plug it into this formula. And then, so if you add all that up, you get, uh, where am I? You get an IX equaling 333 uh, 0.83. That's just for the W shape. Then you got to do the channel. So everybody follow that? Say yes or no. Okay. <laughs> so now you got to do your C 10 by 15.3 shape, right? So that's where you have to look at the chart and you have to use the YY because it's actually rotated, right? Because it's on its side if you're looking up here. And in the chart, it's like this. And so the, the things, so we're using the YY axis from the chart to figure this out. So I 
from the chart, IYY equals, or IY equals 2.28. Do you see that? Yes? yes. Okay. Area equals 4.49. The thickness of the web equals 0 0.240. Therefore, your Z is going to be equal to 4.72 plus 0 0.240. The Z is the difference in the, in the, uh, axis and I got the 4.472 going back up here you know your uh, I think I did that right This, the rest of this to the top of the W shape is 0.472, or I mean 4.72. And then, let me look back at that chart, make sure I did that right. What page is that chart on? <clears throat> okay, so the YY... I might have done that slightly wrong. Hold on. Can it be the, from our reference line, which is now 6.92, to the center of the I-beam, I mean the channel? It, it should be to the YY of the channel. So I think I might have done that. Let me see. TW. Okay, so from the back end of the channel to the Y is the X. I'm looking on the chart. Is, is, is 0.634. And the web thick, I, I did do that wrong. Okay, the web thickness is 2.28. So that distance is... No, that's, I mean, the web thickness is 0 0.240, so 0 0.240 plus, okay, why? Actually, it's half of that, which is 0 0.120 plus your 6.92. No, wait. Yeah, because it has to, your reference, your Z, your YY, mm -hmm. it's going to be, Half of your depth, which is 0.24. No, but if you look at the way the thing is sitting on here, this is your YY right here. So this is your channel depth. You got the whole depth plus this distance right here. I mean, no. We got to figure out. No, you're right. Okay, so it's 0.472 minus this distance, right? And that, and so we got to figure out that distance, which would be the depth, the thickness of the web, or the x with a line over it minus the thickness of the web. So that would be 0.634 minus 0 0.240 would be this distance right here which is the uh, center, the YY for the channel. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> Let me show you. <clears throat> Look. So the YY doesn't sit on in the center of the channel because of the, the legs, right? Yeah, but, but this, the flange, sits on the I-beam. Yeah. So we've got to get that little tiny distance between the bottom of the flange to the YY, which would be the this X 
with a line over it. Oh, okay. That dimension Which is minus point the six three four. Yeah, minus the flange thickness. Do y'all follow that? Josh and Amanda? No? <laughs> See okay. The channel is sitting on right on top of there. Mm -hmm. But the YY of that channel is not it's a little bit below the flange. And we got to figure out that little bitty distance. So we take the uh, that distance that distance is x with a line over it. So that's 0.634 minus the flange thickness, which is 0 0.240, will give us that little tiny distance there, okay. which will be our z. Did you you get that, Amanda? Okay. See the the flange or that sits right on top of there. Mm -hmm. And, and our z is going to be, for this element, is going to be that little tiny distance between yy mm -hmm. and the bottom of the flange. Mm -hmm. So you got to take this distance x, which is 0.634, minus the flange thickness, which is 0 0.240, to get the oh, z. Oh, okay. So I did my problem wrong, slightly wrong anyway. Um, so somebody, we're going to have to re-add this up. So what's our Z going to be? That's why I have to do this alone in a room, so I can <laughs> focus. Uh, where is it? I think you're right, but I just want to double check. Z is the distance between the two parallel axes. Yes, you're right. Okay. So it would be, whatever you said that was, 4.72 minus that. Mm -hmm. to, to that. To the, the middle of... To the, the YY of the channel. To the middle of the channel and the YY. Because our YY and then this would be the center line for the channel. Mm -hmm. So it would be reference to the center here? No, it would be this distance. The YY, that we want to know this distance. And w so we figured... We know this distance, so we just got to take, which is uh, okay, 0.472 minus that little bitty part, which was, you just figured that out. What is okay. So that would be the Z, would be 0.472 minus this little bitty part. So what was that? Point three nine 0.472 minus 0.394. So what is that? Is that 4.72? Yes. 4.72 minus 3.94 equals? 4.3. Okay. So now we have all our elements. So we can say I... equals IO plus AZ squared and that equals 2.28 plus 4.49 times 4.326 squared so that e somebody add that up because my sheet's wrong now really okay 
I didn't think it'd be that much different than the one I had before. What'd you say, 86.307? So now we can plug into our formula that it gives us the radius of gyration, which is R equals the square root of that I over A, which would be this equals to the square root of both I's, which is uh, well, the total I is going to be, let me, go, let me back up. So your I equal, your total I equals 333.834. Why? That was the first one. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were, okay. Plus the second one, which is 86.30. Four twenty point one four, and then your total area is going to equal to both areas, which is four point four nine plus eight point eight five equals thirteen point three four. So now you can plug it into the formula, which is going to be equal to the square root of 420.14 over 13.34. So what is that? 5.61. 5.61. Got it? Now, how do we know is this the right or not? Well, I know. We just got to trust ourselves. <laughs> I think we did it right after we figured out that. I mean, the main thing to understand is the theory behind it. So, I say that that's the right answer. Okay, so that's through chapter 10, and so uh, before you leave, give me your homework so I can just check them. Now I want to move on to, unless there's any more questions on chapter 10, I want to move on to chapter 11. Are you all good with chapter 10? Okay. So, uh, chapter 11, where's my book? Chapter 11, okay, we're talking about uh, stresses and deformation when you, on beams, and we're just building on the knowledge we have. So when a force acts on a body, internal resisting forces are developed within the body by stresses in the material of the body. This is visualized and measured in PSI. So the force creates a stress in the body. Uh, we're particularly interested in internal stresses, including compression, tension, shear, and bending and, tor and torsion. Um, and you can consider the sample, the simple actions of tension and compression, which are called direct forces, is what we're going to be studying in this section. And direct forces uh, can be computed by the formula P equals uh, little f times A, or any variation of that formula, where um, P is the axial direct load or the force, F is the unit stress, and A is the area of the uh, cross section. So that's a formula you need, and of course you can look back in your book for that formula. Um, so in, de in designing structures, engineers uh, must calculate the forces the structure should resist, which would be live loads, the, the uh, 
weight of the building itself, you know, anything that might d cause a force, and uh, determine the most economical material size and shape for each member. Because you don't want to over-design something and have like the incredible hulk of a building that doesn't need to be that way. Uh, that'll be way too expensive and so forth. So um, they need to understand these forces and stresses so they can design the safest, most economical building. Um, ultimate strength, it goes through a bunch of definitions in the chapter. Ultimate strength is the unit stress that causes failure or rupture. So obviously you don't want that much stress on your element or your uh, structural element. Elastic strength is the graded, greatest unit stress a material can resist without a permanent change in shape. So a beam can bend a little bit and then bounce back, but if it bends so much that it doesn't bounce back, then it's reached its, its elastic strength. Uh, stiffness is the property that enables it to resist deformation. Um, all of these are outlined in the chapter. Elasticity is the property that enables it to return to its original size and shape. So some elements, some materials are elastic in nature and so they can sort of bounce back. Um, you can stretch them and they'll bounce back to their original shape. But the elastic limit is the stress beyond which it does not return to its original size and shape. So like when you stretch a rubber band so much that it doesn't go back to its original shape, it, you know, it's beyond its elastic limit. Um, a term plasticity is the opposite of elasticity. Plasticity, plasticity <laughs> is like clay. Um, you can mold it and it'll kind of stay in that shape. Um, ductility is another term, is a property that permits a material to undergo plastic deformation when it is subject to tensile forces, like as a wiring effect. So if you pull something apart, it, it becomes um, deformed uh, in, in, in that way. Malleable, malleability is the property that permits plastic deformation under a compressive force. So if you squash something, it's malleable or you hammer something out like uh, tin or metal, that's mal malleable. So engineers and architects, they need to know the general uh, properties of materials, what they tend to do under certain stresses and forces so they can design properly. And you know, concrete can be very brittle, but when you combine it with steel, it becomes a very cohesive, uh, strong material. Uh, Another term is the modulus of elasticity, uh, which is um, of a material is the ratio of the unit stress to the unit deformation. And again, we have formulas. Um, let me write, it's easier to write up there. So you got the P equals the F over the A, modulus of elasticity, which is capital E, basically equals unit stress over unit deformation. And then, or E equals little f over s. And it gives you all those definitions in there. P is the applied force, F is the unit stress, A is the area, little l is the length of the member in inches, E is the total deformation in inches, S is the unit deformation in inches per inch, and there's also the formula of E total deformation equals PL over AE. All of those are explained in the chapter and you need to read through it carefully as you do your homework. But an example of this, uh, is, uh, so st just quickly, stress is the internal pressures distributed as pounds per square inch, strain is the ratio of lengthening and shortening, and modulus of elasticity is the ratio of stress to strain, or unit deformation. So, and that's F equals uh, P over A, where F is the internal stress equals P over A is one way to figure it out. So a real world example like that, uh, you could use an example of a woman in high heel shoes. 
So how, you know, you don't think that there's going to be much stress on that lady's feet or on the high heels. But, you know, if you're wearing stiletto heels that say are, uh, are it, there's a different amount of stress in the size of the heel. Let's say first you have a heel that is, has an area of three eighths of an inch on one side and one half inch on the other. So the area is going to equal 0.5 times 0.375. Uh, the P would be the weight of the woman, the force on that compressive force, and say that she weighs 125 pounds on a good day. Uh, so then F, the stress, we found from, you know, moving around that earlier formula is going to be equal to P over A, which equals 125 pounds over uh, the area, which is point, I didn't say what that equals, uh, point 0.1875 square inches. So that's point 0.1875. So then your, uh, which equals 666.7 pounds, or PSI. So did you realize when you wore a heel that is 3 eighths inch by 1 half inch, you're putting 666 pounds of pressure per square inch. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> so compare that if you're wearing a stiletto, which is a quarter inch by a quarter inch, which equals to 0 0.0625. Then your, uh, your stress is going to be equal to P over A, which is 125 over 0 0.0625. Then your stress goes up to 2,000 pounds per square inch. So a 125 pound woman on a pair of stiletto heels puts 2,000 pounds per square inch of pressure on those heels. So they have to be pretty strong. So the shoe designer has to design shoes that will hold that up. So you can see that when, when you reduce the size, the stress goes up tremendously. Um, any questions on that? Makes you not want to wear stilettos. <laughs> so, makes you realize how much pressure is just on our feet, you know, just standing up. Um, okay, so uh, in chapter 11, there are some uh, more examples of just, you know, plugging these numbers into the formulas. Uh, you have um, example one on page 221. It talks about a steel rod, one inch in diameter uh, and 10 inches in length, elongates to 0 0.0069 when subjected to a tensile load of 16,000 pounds. Compute the modulus of elasticity. So you take your formula, E equals PL over A little e, and you plug those numbers in. And you, it tells you that uh, your P is your 16,000 pounds. That's the tensile load. 10 is the L, which is the length of the uh, member, the original length. A is the cross-sectional area. And they figured that out to be uh, 0.7854 inches. And then the E, which is the total deformation in inches, uh, they gave you as... Um, Let's see, you want point oh oh six nine. So just plug all those numbers in, and then you get the um, the modulus of elasticity is twenty nine million five hundred twenty thousand, right? Twenty, yeah. I think that's right. So structural statics. Sign me out.
I've, I've already done the homework on these, and it's basically just like the example problems in the book, except, uh, you know, you just plug in different numbers. But I just want to go over um, exactly what you got to do. Oh, I haven't put it up there yet. Sorry. I will put it up there. But I'll tell you right now that the Chapter 11 homework is going to be 11.8a, uh, 11.8b, 11.8c, and d. And then I'll, I'll put this on Canvas as soon as we're done. And then uh, skip 11.11a, but you'll do 11.11b, c, and d. And so basically, in some of these, you've got to look back at other char at charts for the properties of the materials, like wood and stuff like that, that are in previous chapters. So you've got to be aware of that. Um, so I think, I think it's pretty simple. It's just reading between the lines and figuring out what you've got to do. So you all have any questions? Nope.